Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and as you can see from my background, I'm coming to you from the campus of the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture with uh, PATH Presenter uh, and the Digital Pathology Association making these possible. We're grateful for this resource and hope that you find it useful uh, as you consider uh, how to study and how to prepare yourself to practice pathology. Uh, our program today is in the realm of GYN pathology, uh, as uh, many have been. Uh, it's a relatively young woman who has been found to have abnormal bleeding and on the initial biopsy uh, was interpreted as endometrial intraepithelial neoplasia. Uh, still relatively young and not a very good surgical candidate, she opted for conservative hormonal therapy, which on follow-up uh, was not um, uh, effective in eliminating the abnormality. Uh, just to uh, reiterate kind of what are the indications for conservative management of uh, endometrial intraepithelial and neoplasia. Uh, this management consists of uh, progestin uh, hormonal therapy followed by regular uh, uh, endometrial biopsies or evaluation to assess for response and or recurrence uh, or residual. Uh, and generally this is the younger patients who want to preserve uh, the potential for fertility uh, or patients who are a very poor surgical risk. Uh, in some reported studies, the response rates are quite good, uh, up to 88%, uh, but a fair number of patients do experience relapse or persistence, uh, which may range in the re uh, anywhere from 10 to 25%. Um, however, on the positive side, uh, fertility following treatment is still uh, achieved in a, in a significant number of patients. So that's the good news. Well, uh, our patient in uh, failing uh, conservative management ultimately came to hysterectomy. Um, and while we did identify um, areas that uh, might be considered endometrial hyperplasia, as you can see here on this uh, uh, right side, a little bit more uh, hyperplastic and densely air, uh, cellular areas, there were also other areas such as, uh, uh, well, not particularly there, but other areas where um, the uh, lesion of concern became more serious. Um, and that's epitomized by this proliferation area here, where you can see a lot of dark blue glands uh, still uh, forming uh, nice lumens, not much in the way of solid growth here, uh, but certainly very closely spaced, uh, very compact cells uh, with uh, crowded nuclei, a little bit of secretion in some of these, uh, areas, but not very tall and not very cigar-shaped in terms of these uh, nuclei. Uh, so they're a little bit more rounded and the glands are fairly uh, small and compact. Uh, now, as would uh, usually be done in our laboratory, and uh, you know, you compare these glands to the normal endometrial glands or even to something that might be hyperplastic, and you can see there's a, a significant cytologic difference here, uh, even a pot potentially few uh, um, little papillary structures. So with this high-grade appearance, uh, you might wonder about other more serious lesions like uh, serous carcinoma or so forth. Well, we routinely do evaluations with uh, hormone receptors, ER and PR, and um, that's uh, helpful in defining the uh, molecular subtypes that we uh, want to deal with, as well as uh, we also do P53 and MMR uh, mismatch repair protein evaluation. And this patient was uh, P53 wild type in these areas uh, and MMR proficient, but the surprise came when these cells were uniformly hormone receptor negative. Um, and so we did further staining and discovered that this patient was uh, positive with GATA3, uh, positive with PAX8, um, and had areas of TTF1 positivity as well. And so that led us to the diagnosis of uh, mesonephric-like adenocarcinoma. Uh, these are tumors that have a very distinct immunoprofile. Um, they're PAX8 positive, as I mentioned, TTF1 positive in most cases, and GATA3 positive. Uh, so this is an unusual phenotype uh, that would not be expected routinely in endometrial carcinomas. Uh, and especially, uh, they are negative for hormone receptors. Um, 
These oftentimes, at least initially, are low grade appearing, low grade appearing, I emphasize that, uh, and small glandular or tubular patterns. But uh, they can also have a variety of other uh, appearances, including uh, sarcomatoid features uh, or high grade nuclear features that mimic yeah, both low grade and sometimes high grade serous ovarian carcinomas, even borderline tumors, and uh, with the sarcomatous areas, um, uh, mixed uh, Mullerian tumor or carcinosarcoma. Uh, <clears throat> the tumors have been reported in the endometrium, but also in the adnexal or ovarian locations as well as potentially in the cervix, uh, paralleling uh, the sites where we see, uh, you know, Mullerian, or excuse me, uh, uh, mesonephric remnants. Um, KRAS and ARID1A mutations are common, though those, those also can be seen in other endometrial tumors. But some of the other abnormalities that we expect to see in other endometrial carcinomas, such as uh, PIK3CA1, is, are not seen um, in these tumors. Uh, and likewise, uh, mismatch repair defects are also not seen. Now, these tend to uh, uh, have uh, aggressive behavior, and so they're not tumors to be ignored, nor should they be missed, um, but uh, they can easily be uh, mistaken for other tumors, as I've indicated. Uh, and the clues here, uh, you know, may be that if you have a, a tumor that is uh, seeming to fall in the no specific uh, molecular subtype category, but is presenting at advanced stage or is high, uh, appears to be uh, following a, an adverse behavior, that you should consider these kind of tumors. Because in fact, these may account for a significant proportion of those tumors in the no specific molecular subtype category uh, with aggressive behavior. So uh, just to review the uh, mesonephric ducts uh, uh, arise along with the Mullerian uh, precursor ducts, and the remnants uh, rend end up uh, along this lateral border uh, of the uh, uterus, cervix, uh, and running through the adnexal structures. So we know this has a, a, an embryologic uh, um, uh, origin. <clears throat> In terms of immunohistochemical features, I've mentioned some of these, but this uh, is a nice study uh, review ar article that uh, took the data from a, a number of studies to try to compile uh, the number of patients uh, with uh, positive versus negative staining for certain common markers. And as you'll see that virtually all of the cases were P53 negative. Um, CD10, which had been previously used as a marker for uh, mesonephric uh, differentiation, very commonly positive, um, and as we've indicated, the hormone receptors negative. Um, it's not common for us in most endometrial tumors to, or even you know, ovarian tumors otherwise to do PTF1 and GATA3 in terms of routine screening, and so you have to find other things that may uh, tip you off. Uh, in terms of uh, the behavior. And we'll talk about some of those red flags that should trigger uh, further evaluation uh, just in a moment here. Uh, I searched our files and was able to find one additional very interesting case, uh, this not in the endometrium, but in the uh, adnexa. Uh, and as you can see, it's a very blue tumor, uh, a lot of slit-like spaces here, as you can see, uh, sort of rounded nests, uh, not uh, solid. Uh, per se, um, but uh, again, with this very high uh, NC ratio, uh, very uh, hyperchromatic appearing cells, a little bit on the columnar side, and a little bit of small glandular pattern. Now, this tumor also had uh, a sort of secondary component, which you can begin to see here, uh, which uh, begins to appear somewhat sarcomatoid. Um, and so we wondered in this situation if we were dealing with a corded variant of endometrioid carcinoma or with carcinosarcoma or something like that. Uh, and so that led us to do other uh, evaluation. And in fact, this lesion was uh, you know, P53 wild type. Uh, so we didn't feel like it was going to fit into that category. It didn't uh, mark like a, a serous ovarian tumor. Um, but uh, we uh, all did PAX8 staining, which showed nice strong positivity. Um, and then uh, for some reason, we did a GATA3 stain, which as you can see here, uh, nicely highlights uh, the nuclear positivity uh, in these cells. So not an overwhelming uh, uh, type of positivity, but a, a nice, uh, strong uh, response. 
Now, in addition, because we were thinking serous carcinoma, we also did a WT1 stain. Uh, and as you can see, it's uh, uniformly negative with this marker. So uh, if I could summarize kind of the, uh, the uh, red flags that should make us think about this uh, diagnosis, it would be any uh, low-grade endometrioid uh, tumor that is uh, hormone receptor negative. Uh, small glandular pattern may be a helpful clue, uh, but uh, if you don't pick up on that feature, uh, certainly this finding should help you. Uh, likewise, if you have a sarcomatous component, you're beginning to think about uh, malix uh, carcinosarcoma. sarcoma, and it's a wild type P53, well, that should maybe uh, cause you to reconsider. And likewise, any serous appearing tumor that is a WT1 negative in an adnexal site or something like that, uh, then I think I would, again, look a little further, think a little bit more uh, uh, seriously about uh, this diagnosis. Well, I hope those clues are helpful to you. Our final diagnosis on this uh, particular case uh, mesonephric-like adenocarcinoma of the endometrium um, is, uh, I think, well supported by our immunohistochemical and other findings in this case, uh, and uh, should hopefully be a clue uh, and helpful to you in evaluating these kinds of cases. So uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, if you like this, please uh, give us a like and uh, hit that uh, thumbs up uh, sign. And we also welcome you to subscribe to our channel so that you'll catch future releases uh, from our uh, channel as we uh, continue on in the days ahead. We look forward to seeing you again on our program, and uh, thanks so much for joining me.